All right. Father, would you like to join us? Please, please. Be our guest. Be our guest. So we'll put you behind the table. Okay, you know. So funny story. Uh, yeah. We were just in the restroom, Joe and, and I. And, okay, uh, wait, wait. That's not how you lead a story. <laughs> That is He's not how you start a story. He was in a rush, as you could tell, and he said, oh, at Let's least I didn't get any, on, I didn't pee on my pants. And I said, well, you peed on mine. <laughs> and they've been praying for me to have a filter. <laughs> and so he gets the wet spot. Thanks to Father Joe. Oh, yeah, that's Father Joe. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to get started. So yeah, we, funny story. Oh, yeah, so, Joe. So, I'm, some of you might know, I was on Teresa's show this morning. Father, following Father Mike, I'm like, you can't do that to me. Well, <laughs> but anyway, she. So after I got on, uh, before I got on, I told her I said, uh, my wife was just kind of a little scared. She's over here. She was like, you, you don't, scared. yeah, you don't have a filter. <laughs> and so she asked her kids before we left. She was like, you got to pray for Dad. He's going to be on Teresa's live national show. And she, <laughs> he said, she, the kids were great. They were like, no, no, Dad will be fine. Dad will be fine. Dad doesn't have a filter. <laughs> we'll start a novena. <laughs> Who's the patron saint of filters? <laughs> Fram. Oh, here we go. <laughs> That's a that's a farm joke, yeah. Fram oil filters, nobody, but nobody. There's a few chuckles back there. We got some farmers in the house, I know. So, oh, yes, Father, if you wouldn't mind leading us in prayer, sure. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, give you praise and glory. We thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this place. We ask you to please send your Holy Spirit to bless this conversation, to bless this this moment. Lord God, that we can be present to you, that we can recognize your voice, and we can respond with our whole heart. Let us to say yes. Help us to say yes to you with everything. Uh, lighten our minds to know your will. Inflame our hearts to love you, and give us the courage to do whatever it is you ask of us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 So, Father, I have to start off by asking kind of a two-part question. So we know you. there's at least 365 days of, of Bible in a year, 365 catechism in a year. How many Ascension Press videos are there out there? Oh, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, we started in 2015. There's been one every week. One every since, week. Since, since, wow. yes. since 2015. We're sticking dumb. We need the math. Yeah. So, right. So. Yeah. How many? 135. That's it? Well, there's 52 15 weeks. 15 years, 52 weeks. 52 yeah, weeks that's a lot more than that, Billy. That's my uncle. Really don't trust yeah. 52 times 9, right? Is that, or 52 yeah. times 8, we'll be safe. Yeah. Say, wow. Whatever that is. So my second part of that question is, yeah. yeah. So my second part of the question is, uh, have you ever ended a homily with uh, all of us at Ascension Presents? This is Father Mike. <laughs> no, I have to remember to say it. I have to remember. To, yeah, I, I will, though, start. Like if someone says, hey, did you make a video? And sure. I have myself saying, Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz. And then launching, I'm like, oh, that's kind of a sound, familiar sound, but I don't, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just kind of, I was always like, yeah, he's no, got to do that. I mean, so we have to go up. back and watch or listen to the stuff. Like, I listen to the Bible as well. I listen at two times speed. And if I ever do, uh, if I do, ever do the, the, the YouTube, I always do two times speed as well. Because it's just, if I, if I listen at the normal speed, I think, like, I'm so annoyed with that person. And I'm like, <laughs> you are just, you're talking so slowly. You're the most annoying person I've ever heard in my entire life. And welcome to Texas. <laughs> yeah, I got it already. Which is interesting. When we listen to you on Halloween, we put it on three-quarter speed so that we can understand it. So. Yeah. No, there was a, there was a, I got an email from a, a high schooler once, a, couple, a number of years ago. And she said, she wrote me this email. She's saying, I was listening to one of your homilies and I just burst into tears. Mm. And I went down the hallway to my sister's room and I said, listen to this. Uh, Father Mike was preaching at mass and he was drunk. <laughs> and she pressed play and they're both, they said we were both horrified. And like, you, you were drunk at mass. And then we realized that the podcast was on half speed. <laughs> <laughs> And like, okay, we're really relieved, but also just like if, if you ever just please don't, don't ever 
do mass drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so she still felt the need to. So then I, I will go back the, sometimes and I'll listen. I, if yeah. I ever want a really good laugh, I will listen to the homily at point, point five because it's just it sounds so drunk. Because <laughs> every little like non, every, every little imperfection of kind of slurring words that you can get away with a little bit in mm. when you're speaking quickly is. I so was thinking the other day. <laughs> I don't know, it was so funny. Because sometimes you talk like this, you have to slow, to slow that down. It's like, so I was talking like this. But I was having a good time. Everybody wants to have a good You know, it's just yeah. like, oh my gosh, this is, yeah. yeah. It's not like some of the conversations we had after the drink package. Oh, no. <laughs> I, listening, listening, He's not speaking. Yeah, Has yeah. others, you guys, have you all? Who here has the drink package? Right. <laughs> I, Half I, of my group. Do you, do you, yeah, you, you find your. I think this whole room is Texans. Um, <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you find that you you are able to get your money's worth? Yeah. No. Okay. Just I'm just curious. Uh, I wonder. I don't even. There's know a handful of them that went yes. <laughs> yeah, they're back there, yeah. <laughs> we were handing them around, you know. So it's like, mom, put the tequila down, you know. <laughs> so, Father Mike, <clears throat> I'm going to shift gears on. No, no, this is great. Let's keep it going this way. So. Um, I, I guess I'll start off with the question I had at the bottom of the list. Can you tell us about your acting career? Some of them I don't know. No. Oh, I think everybody already you know? knows this. I don't want to go into Not this crowd. Like, no, okay, Robin. So, okay, there, is not, there wasn't really... So the career part of it is, is an exaggeration. So in college, I was in a couple different uh, shows, a couple different plays. Um, I was... Uh, if you, are you familiar with William Shakespeare? <laughs> I was in King Lear. Um, oh, playing, Bill? Playing yeah. the part of Edmund. So Ed, if, you know, if you know King Lear, Edmund is the villain. And it was fun because I, I had really long hair. Uh, it was down on my shoulders. And then I had this goatee because villains, goatees. Tell Father Joe that. And, um, <laughs> but then when it came to the time for it to, to, to show, uh, they gave me like uh, bangs. And so I had bangs and this long hair and a goatee. And um, after the end of the run of the, of the show, was Saturday was the last show and after a couple weeks. And so I was like, I finally, I can finally shave. So I shaved, not realizing I still had bangs. Um, <laughs> and also not realizing and forgetting for a moment that we had mass the next day on Sunday. Because I would just wear a hat, you know, because like cover up the bangs because for two weeks of having the show. And I'm like, no, oh my gosh, I have to go to mass with this Prince Valiant haircut. And, <laughs> and so, but it was really fun part because uh, I got to sword fight on stage twice. Nice. And I got to have the blood packet, you know, and the every it was cool. And the, but again, kind of regrets was um, Shakespeare likes to have people die on. He likes to he likes to yeah. give let people do uh, like a whole speech while they're dying. And so I was one of the people who got to give this speech as I'm dying. And you know I don't know how to act. And so I was acting the way I've seen people die on movies and stuff. <laughs> so I'm giving my words. I just have to speak like, you know, like, oh my gosh, I have to go back sometimes. I'm trying to fall asleep some nights and I think, oh, you are so dumb. <laughs> so you but, sounded drunk again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but but the, I think what's being asked is, so at one point I have an older sister who uh, is in the industry. She's in the entertainment industry. She does wardrobe for different performing artists as they go on the road. And uh, at one point I was in college. I was 20 or 20, 21. I was a sophomore. And uh, she said, hey, there's an open casting call for the part of Robin in the upcoming uh, Batman movie. In Batman Forever, and she's like, and she knew that I was big. I'm a big comic book fan, and I love Robin. So she's like, there's one in Minneapolis, St. Paul area, and I was going to school maybe an hour, hour and a half away. So is that the one with Val Kilmer or George Clooney? Uh, that was a George Clooney. George Clooney, I think. So, yeah, and uh, so she says. Uh, so I go down there, and there's thousands of people, ranging from like eight years old to my age now. And uh, and so they, the first the first audition was that people would walk up to the person and say, oh, you can have a seat or you can leave. You know, you can have a seat, you can leave. And so just weeding through all the get what they want. But then there were a number of casting, a number of callbacks to get people to, to come back and, and audition. And so each audition was progressively more complicated or whatever. And so the last thing was I got a callback to come back to this location at this time. And, uh, and they, they told us at the time that they had narrowed it down to 12 people. Whoa. No, I don't know if that was 12 in the world, that was 12 in Minnesota, 12 wherever. Um, but we down to 12, and what's going to happen is you're going to do a scene and record it and give it to the director, and he's going to pick who he wants. So I walk into this room, and it's, <laughs> so the casting director's name's Mally Finn. So if you see any movies from the 80s and 90s, uh, Mally Finn is the woman. She's, she's, she's the one. 
And uh, actually, fun fact, her daughter, Sarah Finn, is a casting director as well in Hollywood, and she cast all of the Marvel characters. Really? So, so I, I, I was just thinking, I read an article once, like the brilliance of Sarah Finn, mm -hmm. because can you imagine anyone other than Chris Evans being Captain America? Can you imagine nope. anyone other than Chris Hemsworth being Thor? Like, she kind of got all the people. Anyways, so her mom, Mally Finn's there, and there's an assistant casting director there too, and there's a camera guy. And they say, okay, um, <laughs> so, so dumb. I was, again, I was a sophomore in high school, at college. And they're like, well, have a seat on this couch. I'm like, oh, is this the casting coach? And then they kind of chuckled. And I'm like, you said that was out loud. I said it out loud. And I was like, I was like, because I didn't realize. You know, you don't realize. Yeah, yeah. And that's why when I work with college students now and they say things that are so stupid, I'm like, no, no, I would have said something worse. So I, I, I get it. So. So the, the, but they set up the scene, they said, okay, so this is not gonna be this kind of, golly gee, holy smokes, Batman. This is gonna be like a dark, brooding Robin. We wanna have a lot of emotion. Mm. So here's the scene. The scene is, you just got kicked out of school, and you came home, your mom just is coming home, and now she, you're gonna have a fight. And, and uh, so you're sitting on the couch, and she comes into the room, we just want emotion. You just want as much emotion as we can. I'm like, okay, and I'm sitting there, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and she comes in, and we start having this like, uh, fight essentially and at one point we're yelling at each other and then at the end like she's sitting on this chair and I'm on the ground like on her knees just like I'm crying and she's crying I'm like mom and and she's like these tears are coming down she's like okay cut you know she's all emotional and and she's like that was good and then the assistant casting director he's crying too <laughs> and then he's like yeah that was good and then the camera guy it was like wiping tears away from his eyes. He's like, yeah, yeah, you guys, that was, that was really good. And I'm like, oh, this is great, this is fun. You know, so, um, and so they were like, that was, that was a great, uh, would you also want to audition for another role we're casting? Uh, there was a movie called Hackers. I remember that movie. came out in the 90s. And uh, here's the male lead. In this, in this case, Mally will be the girl who's uh, gonna be the love interest in the show, and she wants, just, you kind of flirt with her a bit and have fun. Like, okay, and so we just kind of have this thing, and they're like, "Wow, that was great too." They really liked it too. They were very complimentary. As a, <laughs> and um, I'm like, well, thanks. That sounds great. And a couple weeks later, I got a letter from Warner Brothers saying, "No, thank you." <laughs> <laughs> we, went, we went another direction, but it was really fun. Um, it turns out, so I didn't get the part of Robin, so I wasn't I wasn't in those movies. Um, I also did not get the part of in Hackers, which is maybe good or bad because the guy who did get the part was cast opposite Angelina Jolie. And they actually ended up marrying each other. So, so if it had gone the other direction, I could have been the first ex Mr. Angelina Jolie. Yeah. That, could have, that could have, maybe could have been. This is where, story. and this is why we all realized we all have so much in common with you. We didn't get the part either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never made it to the couch. Yeah. <laughs> Now I hear you're Wait. an introvert. Yes. What's up with that? I, I, do you believe he's an introvert? <laughs> yeah. So he's not going to talk about it. He's not going to talk about it. And it's over. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, you know, that it's not, doesn't, doesn't mean you don't like people, obviously. Right, right. It just mm -hmm. means that um, they cost something. Like, that's the thing, is they cost something to be with people, as opposed to other people that are, they charge your battery. Um, being with people drains my battery. Yeah. So how do you get energized? Being alone. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Leave me, leave leave me alone. alone. That's it. That's the easy yeah. way. I get no, it. no there, there's a, there, that's, you know, having, having time. Yeah. But you get people, like people are great. And yeah. So you get up at what time? Four in the morning? About four. Oh my yeah. goodness. What's your daily routine? I mean, obviously you do give them talks and you yeah. travel and such. No, it's pretty simple. Um, I think if there's I'm, some exercise involved. Yes. Yep, yep, at four. <laughs> I work out uh, and then um, used to come back and record the, the like a podcast, that kind of thing, but now we're not doing that right now. So come back, uh, get cleaned up, uh, holy hour every morning. Then we have, we have all day adoration in our, our campus. And so, but the holy hour, first off, holy hour is 7.50, 7.45 to 8.50. And we create that with our focus missionaries, with our staff and whatever students want to join us. And it's great. And then um, just kind of the rest of the morning is Sometimes meetings mostly just trying to get correspondence done, and I'm not very gifted in that area, mm -hmm. uh, or disciplined. Maybe that's the word. Um, get, that's when like the writing things and thinking things through gets done, and then we're usually starting around noon. If I'm in control of the day, that's when like meetings start, and they go until late in the evening. Wow, it's just yeah, pretty straightforward. So, just being so then, I know that 
your family has, I'm sure, played a, a huge role in yeah. your life. Mm. Yeah. Uh, is there any way that you can kind of share with us maybe <clears throat> your calling and, and their role uh, in your life as a priest? Wow, that's a really good question. You know, sometimes, like, oh, how do you, well, tell, tell me, uh -oh. tell I've me more about what you mean. <laughs> yeah. I've been Elaborate talking on people. the question. Uh -huh. Yeah. No, um, you know, I, I know that uh, you come from a great family. I've, I've watched your show. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess simply, just to make it a little simpler, ask one question. Can you tell us about uh, how you were called to the priesthood? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I mean, yes and yes and I mean, I, yes. Yes, I can. Yes, easily. yes, okay. definitely. I just don't you know, want my wife Yes, but I'm not yes. going to. My wife didn't say yes right away either. Uh, <laughs> Mine told so, me no. It's okay. <laughs> but I, don't to, I don't want to bore it. That's the thing is like sometimes I'm like, wow, that was, I think about it now, and that is... It would be kind of like, um, hey, how'd you meet your wife? What were your first dates like? And you're like, wait, we have years oh, under right. our belt, right? So it's kind of that sense Amen. of, I can still go back and say, okay, you know, 25 years ago, wherever it was, 26 years ago, was when, actually 36 years ago, was what, when like things started. And yet, be like, you'd be like, yeah, but that's so many, that's a lifetime ago. And so it's kind of like, yeah, I totally can, if you want me to, so I will, I'll be brief. Um, <laughs> Wow, this is a really in long intro. <laughs> it's not you're building it up. It's you're not really it worth up. it, you guys. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, was, I was raised uh, in a family that's Catholic, and I would say they're, they're normal Catholic in the sense that uh, pray before meals. Um, it was not unusual for my mom to be praying the rosary at night before she went to bed. Um, we went to Sunday Mass regardless of where we were in life. Uh, the only way you could get out of Sunday Mass is if you're too sick to do anything else the rest of the day. Um, but, and we went to Catholic elementary school because that's what they had. And, uh, but beyond that, it was just pretty, pretty normal, I would say. Um, and I didn't like the church at all. I didn't like going to Catholic school at all. Um, I hated it. I would probably use the word hate. Hated going to mass. Um, I didn't want to go to the Catholic school because there were, there were eight kids in my graduating class. I was one of three boys and there were five girls. And like, I don't want to date any of these girls. So I need to go to the, yeah. I, I want to go to the public school because right. there's more fish in the sea, and, uh, <laughs> and, and yet I stayed there. So what happened is at one point, um, I just, yeah, it was a Holy Spirit encounter with um, my own heart, essentially, where I had an awareness of my own sin. It was, no one gave a talk, no one said anything. It was just this, again, that's why it's just Holy Spirit, was this, I was had this knowledge of, oh my gosh, like I, I sin, like it, I need forgiveness. Like, I can't save myself. I need a savior. Like, oh, oh my gosh. Hey, that's what they've been talking about this whole time. Like, that's, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I just, it, and, and so I knew that I needed to pray and I knew that I needed to go to confession. And um, I didn't know how to pray. Uh, I had a rosary on my bedpost kind of thing, but I was like, I'm not going to ask my mom how to do this. You know, right. I know there's our fathers and Hitler's involved. But um, at one point, I said, we had religious set on Wednesday nights. And there's a little booklet called Youth Praise the Rosary. And I went to Sophie Heglin, uh, Mrs. Heglin, our teacher, and I was like, can I borrow this book? And she's like, yeah, take it, it's yours, keep it. And so I would just like for, for ever then would have the booklet in my rosary and like be praying the rosary. Um, but also I knew I needed to go to confession, so I didn't know the rules. Um, I didn't know, I really, I don't think I knew that confessions were on Saturdays, but also didn't, I was like, I know where the priest lives. So I got on my bike and rode over to his house, 10 o'clock on, on a Tuesday morning, just knocked on the door and he was there because priests only work one day a week, and <laughs> uh, and he like answered. I'm like, Father, can I go to confession right now? He's like, Yeah, sure, come on in. So I sat down on the couch. He went to confession, and as I left, I remember left walking out of that rectory, levitating. Um, yeah, just walking off that porch. Yeah, and I had three three thoughts, very distinct. I can still re still remember them. Was God? I'm so grateful. I just like thank you so much. Like I walked in here, dead in my sins, and. You saved me. You set me free. Like, it's just so grateful. My second thought was, God, if you ever want me to be a priest, I'll hear anyone's confession anytime they ask. Mm. And I had never even thought about it. I didn't like going to church. <laughs> I was like, I would never thought about being a priest before. But that was the first moment where I was like, oh, yeah, God, this is an incredible gift you just gave me. If I could, if I could be part of that for someone else, that would just, that would be an incredible life to live. And... So his first thank you, and my second thought was, if you want to be a priest or whatever. My third thought was, oh, she's really cute. Like, yeah. you know, and so it was like, that started this like big, big right, uh, right. roller coaster of like, what do I do? And, and junior high and high school and college and all those things. And so finally, um, after college, I graduated with a degree in theology from a normal 
Catholic college where, um, just like normal, most Catholic colleges, well, sorry, that's, I don't need to be a jerk about it, but um, <laughs> I graduated four years, after four years uh, at a Catholic school, um, majoring in theology. I was a missionary in Central America, going to mass every day, uh, teaching religion at a Catholic school, and I hated the Catholic church. Okay. Um, because a lot of the things what happened was, and I, I, I can blame other people, but you know, the source of most of our brokenness is ourselves, I, I mean, my own pride, my own brokenness. But that's something I glommed onto was, was the fact that at the school, um, well, the smart people are, are the ones, like, yeah, maybe the church teaches this, but that's because the church needs to catch up to the world. And the church is, you know, so there's, and never got a good answer to my questions. And again, maybe other people could have gotten a better answer if they were less prideful than me or less vain than I am. Um, but there's that sense of, like, I just, yeah, I, was, I hardened my heart to the church. And I'm so grateful because when I was down in Central America at this, at this place, it was run by the SALT uh, uh, Society of Religion, Most Holy Trinity, uh, based out of Texas. Um, right, Corpus Christi, I think? Yep. Think so, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and they, it was incredible because I showed up with a bunch of other missionaries. And it was very clear that right from the go that it was Catholic with a capital C. And I was like, what the heck? And these two priests, <laughs> Father uh, John, who's a co-founder of, of SALT, and then Father Tony, um, that they were on like, oh man, I hate those priests. Like I would go to mass every, every day still. Yeah. And they would, they would get up and preach and they were talking like, the church is true, this is true. And I'd, be, I'd be sitting there to you going. Uh. I mean, I'm rolling my eyes, I'm making those noises. Like, you know, I realize now that you're up there on the pulpit, you can see everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, these guys, you know, and we got meals together, we were living in community. At this long picnic bench, and people be, hey, Father Tony, what's, why do people do such and such? Or what's the teaching on this? And I'm down here on the other end, like making fun of this guy, and just total oh. jerk. And um, a couple of things happened. One is, uh, about six weeks in, I got really, really sick, and and they were like, okay, you know, we have to go to the hospital. Uh, they put me in chemotherapy ultimately to to get rid of this what I had. But here here is Father Tony, and he had this day where he'd get up at five, he. Pray in the, in the church. He'd go across the border. He'd just be going from village to village, bringing the sacraments, bringing everything. Come back across the border, say mass, and now he's going to walk over the little dirt alleyway from the church to the rectory to have some rice and beans before we went to bed that night. And in that alleyway, someone's like, "Father Tony, Mike's really, really sick." And so this guy that I was a like, total jerk to um, doesn't hesitate. He runs back into the church, gets the Eucharist, and gets the holy oils, and runs over to where I am. And I remember lying there, like in sweat, and just like can't, you know, think or. Uh, anything and I remember thinking here he is this man like I my, my kind of excuse for not listening to him was like we well, got yeah, Father Tony he just he all he cares about is the rules he doesn't really know Jesus um, as if that would be true and I'm he's at my bedside and I'm like okay maybe he does know Jesus <laughs> I was really a jerk to him and here he is like you know like huh so it took me a number of weeks to get better and I'm like yeah I'll give Father Tony another shot you know because maybe hey, he's a pretty good guy and I remember the first time I saw him I'm like yeah I hate that guy <laughs> but uh, so that was the one. And then the second thing that happened was a couple weeks after this, every other Tuesday night, the Father Tony would teach the teachers. And one night he was going to teach on a document called Humanae Vitae, mm. which is the church's teaching on openness to life, um, Pope Paul VI. And I was like, I'm not going to go to that. That's ridiculous. That's so stupid. It's so dumb. Because I have the degree in theology. So I know, actually, you know what? <laughs> I am going to go to this, and I'm gonna just going to destroy him. Like, I'm going to... Show him that, and everyone else will know that they, this is completely wrong. It's just absurd. So I walked in, and I remember sitting back, like, bring it on, like, let's go. And he started talking, and he didn't talk like, um, you know, the, the Holy Father says you have to do that. He, was, he just started <laughs> using, like, well, we all know this is true, right? Like, well, yeah. We all know this is true, right? Yeah. Well, if this is true and this is true, then the conclusion is, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, halfway into his talk, I was just like, are you kidding? I never, no one's ever, I, and I walked out of that room, like spinning, thinking I was so wrong and the church was so right. And it was this incredible joy at being wrong. Hmm. That like was the beginning of a crack in my heart to, cause I was like, okay, I'm, st I'm I'll stay Catholic of course, cause Jesus in the Eucharist, like that's what I'll do. But like, I'm not going to love the church. And this was the first like, wait, I can actually love the church. Cause I don't have to be embarrassed by her. And that was my, my experience was I'm embarrassed because I want to be someone who's smart. Um, and the church is stupid, right? Like the, because I didn't get any reasons for why we, you know, believe. 
And so that started this painful journey there as well. I'm like, okay, falling in love more and more with the church. I'm like, wait a second, this church that I'm learning to love again, um, I never said the last question of, God, you call me to be a priest in your church. And so, but God was graceful, uh, grace, gracious and merciful. And um, over the course of that year, it became very, very clear that uh, God was take, inviting me to take that next step and to be, to be a priest. Um, two quick things about this um, is, one is, I rem- so a couple of years ago, Father Tony's in Detroit now. And he's in this, he's in a Hispanic parish in Detroit that's just awesome. Uh, he's doing great. And he invited me over to, because he, he has, for me, does formation with a bunch of young men. And they're like, hey, come over, meet the guys. And, you know, we, and they're like, Father Tony, what was uh, Father Mike like in Belize? <laughs> <laughs> now, now, what had happened was, I, two summers after I left, so I left that one summer, then went to seminary, this, now after one year of seminary, there was a wedding from this yeah. group of the uh, missionaries. Because I have a picture of those missionaries in my year. And it was like, okay, those two are married, those two are married, those two are married, those two are married, those two are married. He's a priest, he's a priest, he's a priest, he's a priest. She's a nun, she's a nun. It was just incredible. Um, it was one of those weddings. Father John and Father Tony came up to the wedding. And I'm like, good, good. right before the ceremony, I caught him in the parking lot and I said, fathers, I, you know, I know that I was really hard uh, to have around, you know, down, down in, in Central America, and just like I'm, just so grateful that you know, for, for you guys, and I just I, mean, I want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry for any time I didn't you know treat you guys well, whatever. And you would have thought that they were like, really, what? They're like, oh no, no, like almost like, who was, are you? I was telling them something they had no idea. And I was like, oh, maybe I wasn't so bad. Like I just thought, was that in my mind? Like I just they, it was actually pretty good, you know. And um, so fast forward, we have a, a young woman named Danny. Danny d- gets graduates UMB, she joins SALT, and Father Tony is her spiritual director. And uh, she's like, oh, Father Tony, uh, Father Mike was my chaplain, you know, in college. And he said he gave you and Father John kind of a hard time. She said, (laughs) Father Tony looked at me, and his head fell down, and he put his face in his hands and started rubbing his face. (laughs) And he looked up and he said, the number of nights Father John and I stayed up late going, what are we going to do with this guy? <laughs> like, we were so close to sending him home. Like, wow. They were so wow. close to being like, you just can't stay here. You can't, like, uh, you're poisoning yeah. everyone's life. <laughs> and I was like, really? Okay. <laughs> so I'm at, at this dinner with Father Tony, and I tell the story about, like, he gave this talk, you know, and, and I'm like, wow, my wife is, life has changed. And, and he said, oh, yeah, but you're forgetting something. I said, what am I forgetting? He said, before the end of the talk, I asked if there were any questions. And you were right there, you raised your hand. And you were, and I said, okay. And he said, yeah, you, you said, well, how come priests can't get married? And he said, I remember standing here thinking, where is this coming from? Like, the talk is on Humane Vitae. And you're bringing up this whole thing. And I was like, there's something going on. And, I thought, and he said that, I thought, oh yeah, I right, that's right. I was grasping for straws, like yeah. something to be angry about. Yeah. <laughs> and then he said, he said, but I do remember this. A week later, maybe two weeks later, uh, the, the religion teachers were all in a van with him, with Father Tony, going to the main city, because he was going to give a talk. And one of the other missionaries said, Father Tony, what are you going to talk about at this thing? And he said what it was, and uh, then he looked at me and he said, Mike, what do you think about that? And he told me, he said, you looked at me and you smiled and you said, I think that sounds really good. And he's like, you had never smiled at me. I had never seen you happy and I knew something was going on. I'm like, oh my gosh, I really was a jerk. (laughs) (laughs) But that's why I'm grateful. That's why I'm grateful. I I, I said that with Father Joe earlier. Whenever I meet students who are jerks or students who are hard-headed or students who say stupid things, I'm like, nope, I'm way worse than you. Like, I, and it's not that you sound like that might be an exaggeration. Yeah. It is not. I was, I will say this, and this is not like to, be, to, to exaggerate. I really mean it. I, or even, I'm the worst person I know. Yeah. But it's, I, it's, I, it's true. And maybe it's true of you too. You might be the worst person you know. Um, but... Because I don't know your heart, I do. I do know mine to a certain degree, and yeah. so it's it's uh, yeah to be able to go back, you know, 26, 20, however many, how many years it is now, and be like, oh my gosh, Lord, I'm still the worst person I know, and you're still here, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. that's that's we need we need both those truths, because if, if, if we don't, we only have the one truth, you <laughs> uh, will fall into despair, and that doesn't help anyone, doesn't glorify God. 
And if I don't know the truth about how broken I am, then I can take God for granted. So just to have to hold on to those two things. It's 1 Corinthians 2.11, only you besides God know, uh, know your own mind. Yeah. Which I think is also something helpful uh, in that the devil can't hear your thoughts. Mm. And that's a very theological thing to say with a priest here. I'm sure you know better, but... Um, I like that term. Great. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I got, great. yeah, I got caught on that term that you said. You know, the joy of being wrong. Yeah, I mean, we as human beings, men especially, we don't like being wrong. And you know, I've been married for almost twenty years. I'm getting lots of practice. <laughs> but yeah, so, so, but it is that's that's hard to find joy in, in ultimately just being wrong. Well, I it, mean, was, it was an encounter with the truth, and that was the part that was joyful, right? Right. It, it was the like, oh my gosh, I was so wrong, and the church was so right because. I had ingrained it in me. Again, I'm not, I, I know there's a, there is a, a problem with Catholic schools um, that is across the country from elementary school to high schools to college students, uh, colleges. But not every, but there's also a problem with me. And because I could have, I know people who made it through and were fine. Um, like what's in, in, what is it in me that was willing to hate the one who cared for me, you know, and, it, and it's, as I said, my own pride, because I was, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed because there weren't, I wasn't given any good answers for my questions. Um, and, and so I thought, well, they must not exist. And how can I be proud of yeah. belonging to the church that's so countercultural for no good reason, you know, in my mind at the time. So. Sure. Tony loves to ask one of our favorite questions, become one of our favorite questions. And that is, uh, what do you see that's so exciting happening in the church right now? Wow, that's a good question. What do you guys, what kind of answers do you guys get? Give us hope, you know, because they, we, we all see, you know, despair. And wow. you know, I turned off the news years ago, amen. Yeah, but, uh, you yeah, know, what's going on that's positive in the church to give us hope, to, to get up in the morning, to pass on to the youth? That's, that's, that's so interesting because I, I, the Lord is so good um, because I just realize, hmm, I get to be in this privileged place like every single day, yeah. uh, being on the college campus for the last 19 years mm -hmm. because I see people struggling, but I see, I see people struggling for the Lord often. I, I mean, again, I know that you might go to a masses where it's like, why are the young people? Well, <laughs> when I get to be at mass, there's all young people. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, um, every, every, I mentioned all day, right now, currently right now in Duluth, there is a chapel, that's a garage, converted to a chapel, that is, uh, there are at least half a dozen students in, in this moment worshiping Jesus in adoration. Mm -hmm. And then in another half hour, there'll be another half dozen students who will be worshiping Jesus. And masses are, are packed. We have 60, maybe going on 70 Bible studies happen every single week um, on our campus. Um, that, again, it's, so, so I, what I see is I, I feel badly for my brother priests because they they don't get to see the fruit of them doing yeah. really good ministry, and because then the kids leave, but the grace is they get to they come hopefully to Duluth, and we get to keep taking and help them take the next step. Because um, yeah. I I it just I, I see it most when I'm meeting with marriage prep couples, mm. and talk to some of my brothers about other couples that they have to uh, deal with. I'm like, oh no, these couples are converted a lot of times, not fully and not perfect, but. Uh, they're not getting married. They're not going to marriage prep with me because they have to. They're doing it because of, no, we want to prepare for a, you know, a life where we're called for holiness and we want to live our lives for each other in the name of Jesus. I'm like, yep, that sounds right. That's, that, that, and that's the norm. Like, that's the norm of the couples that I work with are um, going to Mass more than once a week um, and they're praying regularly and they know that their call is to pick up their cross out of love for each other and families. So the youth is the hope for the future. It, it is our future. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, yes. I, I would also, you know, there's the Lord. Yeah, the there's, that, there's that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, because one of the things, you know, we can get so discouraged by, you know, the, the rise of the nuns. <coughs> so N-O-N-E-S's, right? That mm -hmm. No religious affiliation. And there's a, there's a crisis because it's what's now something over 30% of young people or people under 35, something like this, mm -hmm. have, have no religious affiliation. So a third of the country has said, they check the box, I'm not affiliated with any religion. I'm just spiritual, not religious, maybe. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, 
there is something to be concerned about in that because mm -hmm. that's a, where, where, where our culture is going. At the same time, there's been a lot of thoughts. Um, there's a book that came out 15 to 20 years ago called, uh, it was by a man named Christian Smith, and it was on the spiritual lives of American adolescents. And what he did is he and his team went across the country and they interviewed American adolescents. And it didn't matter if they were atheist, if they were raised Jewish, uh, mainline Protestant, evangelical Protestant, Catholic, they all came back and they all believed the same thing. Hmm. Regardless of how you're raised, you believe in uh, what he, he termed moralistic therapeutic deism. So, the, it, and there's kind of five tenets of this whole thing they identified. And no one would say, oh yeah, I'm a moralistic therapeutic deist. But they would say, okay, moralistic. God wants you to be good. Um, the way that they, the young, the way that the young adults, the 18 to 28 years old, said it is, "Don't be an asshole." That was the, that was, that was their words, not mine. I'm just quoting. Um, it's a scientific study. Um, God genuinely is, um, but, but it's basically be good. Uh, you don't really need God except to solve a crisis in your life, and good people go to heaven when they die. So it's kind of this. This is the idea. This is American religion. This is what we live in. So here, God exists, yeah, I want you to be good, yeah, don't be a jerk, and that's a nicer way to say it. There you go, um, yeah. The, uh, that um, people go to heaven when they die, and you're, basically, if you're not Hitler, you're a good, you're a good person, and um, God is really necessary in your life unless you need him to solve a problem. So this is, that's, that's already been coming, that's already been there. Yeah. So Christian Smith, who works now in Notre Dame, he has a colleague there who said, okay, well, but isn't, isn't the history of like, Judeo-Christianity in the West is that the faith is handed on from parents to their children, from parents, to, you know, parents to generationally. And why did this, you know, millennial, and now Gen Z, why did that fail, why, did that, why was that religion, why was that faith failed to be handed on to their children? And he looked more deeply into it and he realized that, oh, boomers and Gen X believe the same thing as millennials and Gen Z. That that same religion, moralistic therapeutic deists, are what most boomers are and what most Gen Xers are. They just keep checking the box that says, oh, I'm Christian or I'm Catholic or I'm Jewish or I'm whatever. Mm. It's just the young generation is like, no, I'm not gonna check the box. So they hand it on their faith that, that, the, that the millennials and Gen Z got moralistic therapeutic deism from their parents. It just, they didn't realize the parents were also more or less like therapeutic deists. And this became very, very clear when yeah. we did the Bible podcast because I got, I still get countless emails and letters from people who are like, I was raised Catholic, I was raised Christian. Um, I had no idea this is who God really is. And sometimes I had no idea this is who God really is. It's amazing. And I've never, never encountered the Lord like this. This is who he really is. This is the true face of God. And just, you know, this really conversion. And I realize I've been living this anemic faith where I just kind of believe whatever. Also, a number of people who would say, I've been reading the Bible now, doing the podcast, and I can't stand it. Um, I can't keep going. I don't want a God like this. And and like, yep, that's good. I mean, that's, you need to know where you're standing. Like, you thought you were Christian, you thought you were a Catholic, but you just got, you had your own version mm -hmm. versus here's Their God's, own truth. Yeah, here's yeah. God's version. And again, you want someone to say Thanks yes God's to that. But at the same time, you're like, okay, these are people who are like, I'm, I'm 50, I'm 70, I'm 80, I'm 90, and this is the first time I've ever actually let God tell me who he is by yeah. going through the Bible. And that's and that may be for all of us. I don't know. There's um, so many conversations that we had over this weekend or this week that have started with ones that are not with our group, that have started with, well, I, I was raised Catholic, yeah. or I used to be Catholic, or I, you know, fill in the blank. You know, that there, there's been tons of those conversations. And... I guess the beauty of this trip has been so far is just the conversations. Mm, yeah. And it's been a true blessing. And some of the hope that my wife and I have been fortunate enough to be part of a, we have the Axe Retreat in our mm -hmm. area, and we've been part of the Teen Axe, and where we get all these teenagers together. And the hope that we're seeing is these young people that come away from these retreats, they're sticking together. Yeah. When they go off to college, they're forming their own little group. They're, well, they already have the group, but they're sticking together. They're living close to each other. We're, they're even getting married. We have a couple with us that met on the Teen Axe Retreat. And since they started that, and I can't remember what year that was that they started the Teen Axe. Do y'all know what year? Did y'all go on one of the first ones? No. We just did 1692. Okay, so at least back that far, uh, at least almost, I think, 10 couples 
have wow. met and gotten married because they met on those retreats. Yeah, and their faith, I mean, these guys are here with us. Why would you go on a, <laughs> on a Catholic <laughs> cruise unless their faith, they're just living it out. And it's amazing. So That's, that's so cool. <coughs> Father, you, um, <clears throat> I know you don't, it, it seems as if you may not like to talk about it. You know, people make comments about your muscles and your health. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> They were talking about us until you got here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is clapping the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> and laughing. <laughs> yeah. um, my grandfather passed away uh, when he was 39 years old. I'm 42, and all I ever wanted to do was to make it past 39, because I saw how it broke my mother down at 14 years old. Um, <clears throat> is, there a, is there a reason why you are so focused on your health? It, it better be as good as mine. <laughs> If this doesn't work I mean, out, he's going to go into professional wrestling. Shallow yeah. vanity. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, that, so my, my parents, um, they created a culture in my family of, it was never, so um, my dad, so rewind. Uh, my mom wasn't raised at all with uh, any kind of activity. She played basketball. <clears throat> she was raised by nuns. Uh, at 13, her parents shipped her off to a boarding school, a convent run by nuns. So from 13 to 18, she was basically raised by these religious sisters. Um, and so like not a ton of the sports there. She played basketball a little bit, but you know, it was 100 years ago. And so um, it wasn't very, it wasn't really encouraged. My dad, um, kind of interesting, I think, this, I think this is fascinating. When he was a teenager, maybe 14, 15, somewhere in there, he got scarlet fever. Mm-hmm. And he was, uh, maybe he was even 30. I'm not sure how old he was. I'll have to ask him. But he... Uh, as in Scarlet Fever, he had to, he couldn't have any real strenuous activity for six months uh, of being as little as age 15. Couldn't, he had be, he'd just sit on the, on the porch or lay on a couch on the porch. And he said he used to watch kids like run up and down the street, ride their bikes up and down the street. Mm. And he had this thing of like, I can't wait until I can run. And so that's what he did. That he, when he got better, he made the decision like, I'm going to run every day. Um, and so even in, like in med school, um, he was like, my minimum is I run a one mile a day and that's it. And then we, when he got to back to Minnesota, he started cross country skiing and started biking. And so, so he got into marathon running and got into marathon skiing and triathlons and Ironmans. And so my mom started like running as well and kind of a thing like that. And then, um, she, she put us all in swim team when we were six. So, so the, in, this is also interesting. It's just fascinating to me at least. Um, she didn't, she had swim like, she knew how to swim but she was afraid of the water. And so she said, I don't want my kids to ever be afraid of the water the way I am. And so if they're on the swim team, they'll never be afraid of the water like I am. There's something so so good about that, because that's the goal of a parent, right? The, you know that, as we say this a thousand times and say it maybe too often, but the goal of a parent is not to make your kids safe, it's to make them strong. Because um, you can't make the world safe you can make your kids strong to face the dangers of the world. And so that's just one real practical example of my mom saying like, no. So I hated swimming. I was at six years old. All my, my three older siblings were amazing, amazing. And um, for years in swimming on swim team, I was the slowest kid in the slowest lane. Um, and it was just the most discouraging thing where because you finally get back to the wall and they're like, okay, we're already going again. And like just, it was, it was, it was awful. And I never really, I ended up really liking swimming. I got better, so I started winning, and I liked winning. Um, so I did that. But it became, because the culture of my family was, here's my dad who's like, no, you always get up. My dad, he's 80 plus now, or he's in his 80th year. He's 80 years old, um, and he runs every day still. Um, he's in pain, <laughs> but he does it. Um, so, so in my family culture, it was always, there was never, hey, are you going to work out today? It's what are you going to do today? Um, and no. so, so that was, you know, our family vacations were trips to go to races and, and so our, it's just kind of that, that's the, uh, the ethos, you know, the culture of our family is, is, is that. So if you're going to marry into the family, you have to, you literally, everyone who's married into the family has to complete an Ironman triathlon, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably why not everyone is married yet. <laughs> yeah. It's a good filter. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, in in your uh, in your busy schedule, uh, we were talking, and uh, it seems that 
you know, there's only, I mean, gosh, uh, Father Frank and uh, Jason and Rachel Bowman, uh, we noticed that a similar theme came up, and that is the greatest, actually, uh, Deacon Jason Bowman said, the greatest leisure is the Mass. Okay. And it's interesting because I don't know if I was having a dream this morning uh, or it was just the ship rocking me, <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> I had a thought about you this morning, uh, which was in, in such a busy life, um, is there a moment that is your ultimate escape? <laughs> Are so, these too deep? I mean, I can... I don't know. I don't know. Because there's, because there's the uh, to ultimate escape. But ultimate escape. Like, am I escaping from reality? Or am I, you're recreating, like entering into uh, recreation. Recreation. So what... So yes. So is the mass for you? Here is here is no mass is work. <laughs> ah, that's the job. Yeah, it's it's the job. So you that hopefully people can show up, and but you actually actually you, your job is to work at mass too. So it's it's I don't know mass I don't know the mass is leisure, um, mass is worship, yeah. and worship is work, where you we're are not there to be entertained. You're offering there up the work. sacrifice yeah. of the Son to the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not along for the ride. Not there just to kind of take in, although sometimes we're carried along and sometimes we do, you know, receive. But uh, worship is, if you've been baptized, you've been anointed a kingdom priest, which means you're there to offer up the sacrifice with the ministerial priest, united to Jesus Christ, the high priest. And if we're not doing that, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing at Mass. And so maybe Deacon Jason can call that leisure, which is awesome, a place of rest, which is wonderful. And I can see how that would be, you know, um, Real and completely real, yeah. At the same time, um, as as maybe the the presider at mass, um, no, you're. You, I I the way I sometimes see it is a you have to preach, so you got to be hopefully you worked and got ready to do that, <laughs> and you're not just showing up and winging it. Um, B, you're leading a group of people up the mountain to offer worship to the Father, and so if you're relaxed, what are you rest resting if you're it, you know, a place of uh, rest in that moment. Like, what are you doing? You're not doing yeah. what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Let, let me give Jason credit that yeah. he explained it way better than I just <laughs> asked. It, okay, <laughs> for the point. Well, so, no, it's that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, but if, you, if you're saying there are times where it's like, no, here I am. You show up to mass, uh, and you are weary, and you're like, I can't lift my head. Okay, you'll be carried along by the mass. So I say all that with the with the notion that the truth is at the mass. This is, liturgy means the work of the people, right? And so it's, it's the work of the people, um, not the rest of the people. But at the same time, God gives us Sabbath rest, so he gives us the day of rest, where he ceases from all his labors. And so there's a sense there too, but you are resting in, in some ways, right? So you're entering into a new space. The space is, um, is work and worship, um, but also in, in a mysterious way is, is rest too. So like, I'm, I'm yeah. not saying anything against him. Oh, sure. Um, but like... Uh, that's it's not a place of rest for me. <laughs> I'll say like that. Thanks, for, and thanks for being. And I think most of us can agree who have children. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> so, what you just, yeah. Which is a big piece of it, right? So, so, and that's a that's a, a struggle. I think for all of us. Let's be honest. Children. Um, I mean, I sometimes. Okay, I'm going to say a hot hot take. My unpopular opinion. I shouldn't say this because half the, you all are going to be mad at me. Half of you are all going to say, oh, I thought I liked you. Well, that was um, the show, folks. <laughs> and that Thanks is, for throwing that Texas word in, y'all. Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't like kids at mass. Um, that's it. No problem. So big cry room is the answer? I, I just no, stay in college ministry. Because... <laughs> 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 But but where do kids belong? They belong in mass, you know. So so that's you know so it's like, um, but you don't either. Oh. You don't like kids at mass either who are making distractions and making noise, all that kind of thing. You're like, oh no, I do. It's a sign of the future of the church. Yeah, if you tell yourself that, that's great. But you don't like it, do you? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, yeah. Tongue in cheek and making a joke about this whole thing. Um, because I see the dis disapproving looks. Um, <laughs> I saw it off on my mother's face, but I'm okay, whatever. Um, no, but there's a, there's a reality there that is um, that parents, um, I don't know how many times my siblings will say, like, I haven't heard a homily for the last however many years because I've been taking care of the kids. And there's something about that that's like, yes, that's not wasted. Why? Because what's the heart of the Mass? The heart of the Mass is sacrifice. What are you doing? 
when you're bringing your children to Mass because you know you're supposed to. You're making a sacrifice. What, what are you doing when you're like, okay, all these looks, I'm trying to get them settled down, but they just can't, your sacrifice. What happens when I can't, I haven't heard the last 12 homilies, because you've been caring for this person and everything you've been doing is a sacrifice. And that's the thing is like, that's not, not the mass. That is the mass. Why? Because and I mentioned this, Fulton Sheen had mentioned this once. He had in the book, A Priest is Not His Own, he said that when the priests get ordained, they're so excited to offer up the sacrifice. They're excited to be the priest. But we forget that Jesus was not only the priest, he was also the sacrifice. And so priests, ministerial priests, are going to be priests after Christ's own heart. They have to also be willing to be sacrificed as well. And if you're going to be kingdom priests, you have to also be willing to be kingdom sacrifices. And what more of a sacrifice is there than I wish I could enter into rest in the mass, but I'm here and I have to still be dad. I'm here, I still have to be mom, I still have to be grandma, or grandpa, and I still have to take care of these kids because they're supposed to be here too, but they just don't know how to behave yet or whatever. So they're going through a tough time. And so to be able to say that's not wasted, as long as it's offered. Does that make some sense? Mm -hmm. So full yeah. circle, yeah. I got to say <laughs> right. my unpopular opinion. That's your point. Um, but okay. at the same time, that's where they belong. And to be distracted in mass, I mean, annoyance in mass, whether they're a two years old or 92 years old, because we all can annoy each other, um, to offer up that sacrifice. And that's the point of the whole thing. And the greatest thing we can do as laity is to go to Mass, to fully participate mm -hmm. in Mass. I mean, like, let's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Fridays, you know, s seven days a week if we can. Yeah. I mean, don't you say? I mean, well, yeah, and that fully participation. Yeah. Uh, sometimes say full participation doesn't mean you're a lector, doesn't mean you're a greeter, doesn't mean you're a third-year minister. Full participation means you're a kingdom priest and you're offering the sacrifice of the Son to the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit with the ministerial priest, united to Jesus, the high priest. That's what act, full and active participation is. Is that the thing I always come came back to, keep coming back to, is too many Catholics um, waste your priesthood because you don't offer that. You just watch, watch. I'm, wa I'm here to watch Father pray, and 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 that's that's not the job. Some of the some people say, well, you need to sing then. No, you. Actually, I got an email. Maybe I'll make a video about this. I get back. We're gonna have to finish up I, with this because I, I think that's a great one. If I sing, and like if I don't sing, you don't like singing, like you're fine. Just make sure you pray. Uh, but that's the main point, is not to watch the priest pray, yeah. but to worship and offer the sacrifice TV, with the you're yeah. staring at it. No, right. yeah. that's not it. You're not passive. Mm. Right. Yeah, you're engaged. Father Mike, we just can't thank you enough for spending some time with us. We could sit here, I think, all day, but they've got this room booked for yeah. another event. I think Dr. Ray is <laughs> wanting to come in. So, uh, we again, thank you so much for everything you're Thanks doing. Oh, yeah. this has been fun. It's been a blast. And thank the crowd for being here. Yeah. It's been amazing. So, as we always do, in the meantime, be bold, be real, be Catholic. God bless. God bless.